There is so much conjecture among academics about aspects of the archaeological and geological record and its measurement or even what discoveries can be included in our history that the Rangling has an eroded agreement on our one view of history. We can't stress it enough that the history of the ancient monuments of this world are told in a time when self-prosperity and continuation of wealth from father to son was more important than learning the actual truth of the ancient story. The history of our world is not a lie, but the truth has yet to be told in a far-reaching way that makes sense. The credibility of the false story is one in which is grasped upon simply because we are afraid to accept that we have been lied to as a civilization. The process of the awakening is a slow one, but it is one which is spreading across the globe even as we speak. Indigenous cultures around the world on all continents have spoken histories and cultural origin stories of a deluge of waters and some of benevolent strangers offering support and prosperity and then leaving or becoming part of history in some spectacular fashion. The signs are everywhere. The writing is on the wall. Wait to hear this. Dolmens are simple structures made of monolithic stones erected during the late Neolithic period or Korean Bronze Age around the first millennium BC. In ancient Korea, they appear most often near villages and the archaeological finds buried within them imply that they were constructed as tombs for elite members of the community, though such efforts could be of astronomical significance. Over 200,000 megalithic structures have been recorded in Korea, with 90% of them in South Korea, where they have the status of protected monuments. Most of the stones used are massive, with the largest example found being 5.5 meters wide and 7.1 meters tall, and many weighing over an eye-watering 70 tons. Archaeological evidence illustrates that Bronze Age culture spread down into the Korean Peninsula from Manchuria, especially the Sungari and Lao River basins. Mixing with the indigenous Neolithic population, this new culture likely created social elite, which was responsible for and was honored by the erection of dolmen tombs, or at least that's the theory. The presence of the Korean islands of Chiju and Kanghua and areas of Japan of similar dolmens suggest that the cultural wave did not stop at the Korean mainland, but also crossed the relatively narrow straits to the Japanese islands. The dolmen structures can take three different forms and precise configuration differ depending on the region. The first type, more common in the north of the peninsula, is the table or takcha, from where one large stone rests horizontally on two or more upright stones, often arranged in a square. The second type, known as paddock, has one large flat stone set on top of a mound of smaller stones. The third type, seen more often in the south, has a single large stone laid flat above a small rectangular buried tomb, which is lined with stone slabs. Alternatively, the tomb may consist of a simpler jar burial, perhaps for a child. The first type of dolmen most often occurs in isolation, while the others are sometimes found set in rows or groups. Outstanding examples of ancient Korean dolmens are the table-type structures on Ganghua Island, which date to 1000 BC in the Korean Bronze Age. Single standing stones unrelated to a burial context and perhaps used as marker stones are also found across Korea. While dolmens usually occur as a single isolated monument, there are cemeteries in the south which consist of hundreds of examples placed in close proximity, sometimes 
in a straight line. This would suggest that the individuals interred therein were part of the same elite class, perhaps two, the same dynasty of rulers. Dolmen tombs typically contain the remains of a single individual whose status is revealed by the precious bronze goods within and by the very fact that they had a tomb constructed which involved the intense labor of moving the dolmen stones over many kilometers from their source. The enormous size of the stones involved would also suggest that the communities that built them were more than just villages. Such was the manpower needed in moving the stones. How they were moved and erected is completely unclear, for this to be manpower alone would involve thousands of men. If you imagine the scene in your mind, it is Kamality to say the least, but the very well-documented Thunderstone of Russia was moved in such a way over a vast distance, so it is possible the Koreans had developed a similar method. Excavations of the tombs under dolmens have revealed bronze goods such as daggers, swords, bells, and even mirrors, but also polished stone daggers and burnished pottery. Several tombs also contain jade or amazonite beads, some in the crescent shape known as a gogowitch, possibly originated in Siberia and represents new life. Gogok would reappear in later ornamentation, notably on the golden crowns of the Sila kingdom, which was one of the three kingdoms of ancient Korea, and the one that in the year 668, it unified Korea under the unified Sila dynasty. Sila is traditionally believed to have been founded in 57 BC. By the second century, a distinct confederation of local tribes was definitely in existence in the southeastern portion of the Korean peninsula. With the establishment of the hereditary monarchy of the Kim family during the reign of King Namal, the proclamation of state laws and decrees and the annexation of the eastern half of the Kaya state on the eastern tip of the peninsula in the reign of King Papmung Sila emerged as a full-fledged kingdom. One of the richest tombs is at Namsung Ri, containing more than 100 bronze artifacts, which besides mirrors and daggers, includes an axe, chisel, a lacquered birch bark scabbard, and tubular-shaped jade beads. It may be that some objects were those of a shaman, and there is evidence that shamans were also tribal chiefs in early Korea. One curiosity which historians and archaeologists have yet to solve is why the finds in tombs vary and those with more precious bronze goods are actually the least impressive dolmens. The significance of the size of the capstone has also been debated amongst scholars and whether that signifies the status of the buried individual within. Exactly how the stones were erected is an additional source of disagreement, and another issue is the great similarity between Korean and European dolmens, like the ones at Karnak, without any evidence of contact between the two areas at the time of construction. It is clear that these impressive but mysterious monuments will continue to pose puzzling questions, just as they, no doubt, have to the successive ancient cultures of Korea who left them intact for posterity. What do you guys make of the ancient stones? Comments below and as always, thank you for watching. Now, dolmens are prehistoric stone graves built thousands of years ago during the Neolithic and Bronze Ages. More than half of the dolmens remaining in the world are found on the Korean Peninsula. And that's what Kuchang, Hwasun, and Kanghua dolmen sites represent. Our Lee Min Young shows us to the prehistoric dolmens, Korea's UNESCO World Heritage. These monumental rocks are here not by accident nor by coincidence. 
They date back to the Neolithic or New Stone Age and the Bronze Age, and they are prehistoric tombs called dolmens, built with large stones known as megaliths. Dolmens in Korean are known as koindol, which means supported stones. And more than half of remaining dolmens around the world are densely concentrated in the Korean peninsula. For that reason and for the value they hold, three major dolmen grounds in Korea have been designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites in 2000, namely the Kuchang Hwasun and Kangwa Dolmen sites. The three dolmen sites in Korea have an outstanding archaeological value. They have been drawing a lot of attention from archaeologists worldwide because nowhere in the world dolmens can be found in such great density and variety. Among the three, Kuchang is home to about 450 dolmens, concentrated within a 1.8 kilometer radius. Besides the sheer number of dolmens clustered in Kuchang, the area is also characterized by uniquely shaped dolmens, which have been classified as hybrid types. Dolmens in Korea can be categorized broadly into three different types the table type, the go table type, and the stone cover type. Here in Kochang, you can take a look at all three of them, in addition to some dolmens that feature mixed elements of the three. This dolmen is named after its table-like shape. The grave is built with four to six stone stabs standing straight on the ground forming a stone chamber and usually topped with a large capstone. These dolmens, on the other hand, are shaped like a go table or checkerboard, featuring a large covering stone on top of several footstones. The main characteristic of this type of dolmen is that the body is buried underground. The most common type of dolmen, however, is the stone-covered type, which, as the name depicts, is a grave covered with a capstone. But besides these three, other forms of dolmen have been found in Kuchang, which reflect the interaction and coexistence among various cultures. As you can see, a table-type dolmen is supposed to have a flat flagstone on top, but instead, this hybrid dolmen features a large covering stone. This clearly shows that tribes with different funerary cultures coexisted together. The dolmens in Kuchang also vary in size. This is the largest dolmen in the world. This enormous prehistoric tomb weighs nearly 300 tons and stands 5 meters high. It remains a mystery how people were able to build a tomb of this size over 3,000 years ago. Experts assume that people of that time cut stones by making a hole on a large rock and placing a wooden stick in the crevice. Continuously pouring water on the hole would have swollen up the wooden stick, eventually splitting up the rock. More than 3,000 years have passed, but these dolmens are still standing to this day. The only way to explain this is that our ancestors had surprisingly advanced construction skills. These monumental prehistoric relics contain the key to understanding how life was during the Bronze Age. Dolmens are a world cultural heritage and hold a universal value that needs to be protected for not only all mankind, but also for the future generations to come. People who lived on this land 3,000 years ago are telling us a story. It was an existence that was a religious belief for the ancients and a fruit of science. A mystery that has been kept hidden for thousands of years lies right before your eyes. Togo Kwasun, Jeollanamdo Province is one of Korea's major dolmen sites. Over 600 dolmens from the Bronze Age are spread out across the hill. The dolmens are called southern-style dolmens because they are mostly found in the southern region of Korea.
In the southern style dolmens, the ground is dug up first, after which a chamber is made with stone in which the body is buried. Several smaller stones are placed around the burial site, after which a large stone is placed on top. There is a massive dolmen that stands out in the Hwasun Dolmen site. Korean dolmens are much larger than the dolmens found in other countries. At the Hwasun Dolmen site alone, there are dozens of dolmens that weigh over 100 tons. Pingmei Rock, the largest dolmen in Hwasun, weighs a whopping 290 tons. The massive dolmen's weight is staggering. How did the people of the Bronze Age build such a large dolmen at a time when cranes did not exist? Where did the large stones used to build the dolmens come from? We found traces of stone cutting on rocks at a nearby mountain. There were incisions at certain intervals. Could this be proof that the rocks were cut? We use traditional stone cutting methods as a reference to find out. First, holes are carved using stone and dry wood is hammered into the hole. Then water is poured over the wood, making it expand, thus cutting the rock. This would leave behind traces on the rock having been cut. But there is another mystery to solve. How were the people able to move such heavy stones? It is about 300 meters from the mountains to the dolmen. How were they able to move a rock that weighed hundreds of tons without any special equipment? Looking closely, we can see that the large flat cover stone is placed on top of smaller stones on the ground. Then, how were they able to move the massive stone and place them on top of the smaller stones. Considering the circumstances, perhaps they used the logs they used to cut the rock. If they had used logs and ropes as a lever, it would have been possible to lift the stone. And if logs were placed on the ground with the rock on top, the logs could be rolled to move the massive stone. Also, if a gradual slope was made around the bottom stones with earth, the cover stone could have been rolled up the slope. The dolmens are structures that were built by carefully laying down the foundation, artifacts that were created using scientific principles. Ancient people wished to communicate with the gods. They believed that the light reflected from mirrors would convey their wishes to the heavens. Who owned the mirrors that shone the light which called upon gods thousands of years ago? The world's largest dolmen site is located in Kuchang Chala Pukdo province. Hundreds of dolmens left behind by people of the Bronze Age 3,000 years ago stand at the foot of a mountain. The dolmens of Mezan village are not just many in number, the shapes and sizes are all different as well. There is one dolmen that stands out. The cover stone alone weighs hundreds of tons. It is four meters in height, a massive stone grave. How many people were mobilized to build this dolmen? 
If we can calculate the number, perhaps we can estimate the size of Mezan village during the Bronze Age. On average, it takes the strength of 10 adult men in order to transport a one-ton rock. Therefore, nearly 3,000 men would have been needed to transport a 297-ton rock. If we then add the average number of families, we reach the conclusion that at least 15,000 people were living in a single village. These graves are found in each region in large groups. The large communities and massive dolmens support the fact that the Bronze Age was a hierarchical society. An authority that ruled and led the members of the society. It was they who mobilized manpower to build massive graves for themselves. The appearance of rulers that governed over the Bronze Age society. Who could they have been? We found clues about the ruling class among the artifacts. There are bronze artifacts that are found in all the exceptionally large graves. One of which is the bronze rattle with eight bells. The rattle made from bronze is the most typical artifact from the Bronze Age. Another artifact found in the graves of the ruling class is a bronze mirror, the Tanyus Hemungyong. It is the essence of the Bronze Age culture, carved with a beautiful geometric pattern. The Tanyus Hemungyong mirror was a valuable item that only the ruling class could own. At an age where people worshipped the heavens, the bronze rattles and mirrors were used during ceremonial rites. The head of the tribe would hang the shiny mirror around his neck and shake the bronze rattle as he communicated with the gods. They were symbols that showed he was the one that carried out the gods' will. An age where people were divided into class and rulers appeared, creating a new social order that was different from before. The society of the Bronze Age went through dynamic changes as it passed through history.